In this video, I'm going to be talking about the BBL. In the last couple of years, this subject has exploded and it's everywhere. Virtually everyone seems to be getting a BBL, not just the celebrities anymore. And you might be thinking, I need to get me a BBL too. If you are, don't go anywhere. You must watch this video. Hey guys and welcome, I am Dr. K, I'm a family physician and a cosmetic doctor and that's really my intro. Done. All I'm going to ask is that you follow me on Instagram and my socials and you consider liking this video and let's move on to today's video. I'm talking about the word on the street or the BBL as it's called. It's hard to believe how those three letters mean so much. It's even funnier to realize that 10 years ago, virtually no one knew what a BBL was. Now, you just have to say BBL and even Patty down the street, she knows what you're talking about. You talk to Mike, he knows what you're talking about. Everyone knows what a BBL is. But if you don't, then I'm going to break it down for you. BBL means Brazilian butt lift. Funny, isn't it? how we're in this position in 2021 talking about BBL, the almighty BBL. The reason why I'm talking about the BBL is that at this point in time, in 2021, it is the world's fastest growing plastic surgery trend. I'm going to give you some facts. Since 2015, did you know that the number of Brazilian butt lifts or BBLs as we know it in these parts has risen by 77.6%. That's a whole load of people having BBLs. No wonder it seems like everyone, and I mean everyone, seems to be having one. So where has this all come from? The clue is in the name, Brazil. It's been going on as far as the 1960s, when it was pioneered. I don't know why I put quote marks because this is actually what happened. It was actually pioneered by the Brazilian surgeon Ivo Pitton Guy, but it's taken a while for it to get to the point where it is now. It gradually over the decades spread from South America to North America, then to Europe and now the rest of the world. So this video is going to be a mixture of facts and opinions. And by opinion, I mean my opinion because it's my channel and I can only talk about my opinion on this channel. You might have a different opinion. You might have had a BBL and have had a slightly different viewpoint to what I'm saying. That's absolutely fine. It's a, it's a free world. It's a free country. We all are allowed to have our own different opinions. That's how we can all coexist. So I just want you to bear that in mind when watching this video. So that's my disclaimer out of the way. So why do I have an opinion about the BBL? What makes me qualified to talk about the BBL? Simple, I'm a black woman, hence the target demographic of this whole BBL trend. I'm also a doctor, so I've got some health background to talk about the BBL and the health effects, and I'm also a cosmetic doctor. I've not done butt injections personally, I've carried out butt injections on patients and clients. So I can also give an opinion about what is what. So let's get the facts out of the way and talk about what the BBL procedure involves and then we can move on to the opinion. A BBL is very simple in theory. It's just basically a mechanics of redistribution. You're taking fat from an undesirable area and you're injecting it into a desired area to give increased body shaping and contouring. So let me break it down even more than that. Before you end up anywhere near an operating table, there are some certain steps that need to happen. You would have a consultation, I would hope, with the surgeon that's carrying out the BBL, and it's there that you end up discussing about what results you're after, and they can see what you're working with. They'll be able to highlight which areas that the fat can be realistically taken from, and also talk about how much fat and what the plan is for where it will be injected into. Once you're both on the same page and you're all agreed, then you'll go and have a pre-assessment screening. The reason for the pre-assessment screening is that very often you'll be having the BBL 
under general anesthetic, meaning that you'll be asleep in theatre for a number of hours. It's very important because this is a very vulnerable stage. So all efforts are taken to make sure that your health is optimised and that we know about everything that we possibly can to do with your health. That way we don't have any nasty surprises on the operating table. Once you've cleared that part, now you're on to the actual meat and bones, the day of the surgery. You'll come in at a specified time and again, you'll get to see the surgeon and any last minute questions or issues, this is the time to address them. They'll get you to change into your theatre gowns and the areas where the fat will be harvested from and injected to will be marked and they'll take some before pictures too. Once that's done, then you're in theatre and this is where the magic happens. Whilst you're asleep, the surgeon makes tiny cuts in and around the areas where the fat will be harvested from. This is to allow a small hollow tube called a cannula to be put in and a saline solution containing lidocaine and adrenaline is injected in. This makes it easier to harvest the fat, otherwise it would be very difficult and you're more likely to bleed. Once all the fat is sucked away, it's then cleaned and separated from blood and other tissues. Now it's really important to realize that you've got a time pressure and the surgeon is working under a time clock. Fat cells only survive for up to an hour or two at the very most. Once separated, the fat is then injected into specific areas in and around the butt to give you that smooth outline. The whole process can take anything up to six hours. Once complete, those small cuts from earlier are then stitched up and you're fitted with a compression garment which you'll then have to wear for the next six to eight weeks. The entire procedure is done blind. It doesn't mean that your surgeon is blind or the whole theatre is dark and blacked out. Nope. What it means is that the surgeon is not actually seeing exactly where they're injecting to. This is because the whole process is done and the fat is injected underneath the skin. They have to rely on their experience, their knowledge of human anatomy and overall skill to make sure that they're injecting in the right area. So you think it's all over when the surgeon is done? No. This is when the real work starts, the process of recovery. For the first six weeks, you will have to wear that compression garment night and day because by doing so, you're going to improve your results you're gonna minimize bleeding and pulling and tearing on tissues. So it's really essential that you keep it on. Secondly, you're now gonna play a waiting game to see exactly how much of the fat that's been implanted survives. We find that with a BBL, only around 40, 50% of the fat actually survives. The rest dies and is reabsorbed by your body's lymphatic system. That means that all that juice, all that plumpness you're looking for, you have to temper your expectations and dial it down by 50%. So this is where your story begins and you now have to start playing a waiting game to see exactly how much of the fat survives and how much dies off. You can help your chances by following the aftercare and making sure that your health before and post-surgery is tip top. And the good news is that whatever you're left with around the six month mark is likely to be permanent. Instead of being put off, you might have actually become more interested in a BBL and are actually starting to think more practically in terms of what it actually costs. Costs can vary, but BBLs are expensive. They are expensive. Here in the UK, it can cost up to £8,000 for one round of BBL although costs can be cheaper if you were to go to a different country. For you to have a successful BBL, you need to have the fat taken away from a fat-rich area. And in most human beings, like you and me, those areas tend to be around your torso. So that's your stomach and the love handles. Although you can also have it taken from the thighs and from around the knees. And I know I'm going to sound like a stick in the mud and I'm kind of always advocating for slow and steady, but that's because when it comes to cosmetic surgery and plastic surgery, it really is the best way to avoid doing something that you will regret. And it's easier to add on than to correct a surgery that's gone wrong. And that's the same approach with BBLs. I wouldn't, as much as you want to have every taken away and snatched in the first round of BBL, it's not realistic and it's not advisable. If you end up taking too much fat, 
you can be left with excess folds of loose skin and that's not a good look. So I would listen to your surgeon and follow their advice about how much they think it's reasonable to take away. Here in the UK, there are guidelines about how much volume you can inject in. That amount is set at 300 cc's, which is about the size of a can of Coke. And that is per buttock, per each bum cheek, per each side. If you were to speak to a hundred surgeons, you will have a hundred different opinions, but they generally agree that the closer you are to your ideal weight, the better. You'll be hard pressed to find a surgeon that will be willing to operate on somebody that has a BMI of over 30. In medical terms, this is classed as being obese. I know in real world, in real life, people have different body types, but strictly looking by the book, a BMI of 30 is a hard pass. Now, what about the other end of the scale? Ideally, we're looking at a BMI of no less than 23. So somewhere between that range is perfect. Isn't BMI just a number? Why are they so pressed about whether it's 30 or 35 or 25? It's just a number, right? Well, that's wrong. Generally speaking, the higher your BMI is, the more risk of complications on the operating table. That could be complications from having the anesthetic agent and actually being put to sleep and complications from the surgery itself. Generally speaking, most surgeons try to avoid complications in their patients. I don't know anybody that deliberately tries to make things go wrong. So if they can stay on the straight and narrow as much as possible, that's what they'll do. However, I will say that it's not just the BMI, that's the be all and end all. There will be other things like your body fat percentage, what body type you are, which places you gain weight, and what kind of results that you're looking for. If you're very, very skinny and you want to have Cardi B's body or Nicki Minaj's bum, and you are a BMI of 20, and you don't store a lot of fat, that is less realistic and less achievable that's, than somebody else. So it's a case by case basis and your surgeon will be the best person to talk about this with. If you're one of those naturally blessed people and you are blessed, take it from me to have a very fast metabolism and you don't tend to store fat much on your body, then you have to think, what's the point of the procedure? Because if I was to take it back, the whole point is that you're going to have to have some measure of fat to take away and put in a different area. So if you don't have enough fat to harvest, then there's really no point in having the procedure. I'm sorry to be very blunt and straight to the point, but it's really about the technicalities of the procedure. This is not a good idea for two reasons. You have to understand that by gaining weight, your fat cells don't increase in number, but rather they swell in size. Unfortunately, as the fat cells get larger, they're more likely to get injured and be trapped in the small openings of the holoplastic tube, the cannula. Smaller fat cells have a much better chance of getting through the cannula holes unharmed. What makes your BBL procedure successful and gives you the results you're after is ensuring that as much of the fat cells survive during the harvesting and transfer process. Number two, if it's not your natural body weight and you artificially gain weight, this is not normal for you. More than likely, this weight won't stick and you will lose all that weight that you've worked hard to gain. This means that you will lose all that volume that you've gained once your body returns to its normal weight. I'm going to say this louder for those of you in the back. And that is, a BBL is not weight loss surgery. You're not going to shed the pounds or lose dress sizes going down from a size 16 all the way to a size 0. It doesn't happen with a BBL. All the BBL does, all the BBL will do is that it will shape your body contours so that you have that hourglass figure that is so on trend right now. It's so hot right now. Absolutely. So why is the BBL causing so much controversy out here in these streets? In theory, it's a straightforward procedure. It's like Robin Hood. You're taken from the rich and you're given to the poor. Earlier, I said that the BBL was the world's fastest growing plastic surgery. 
but it's also the world's most dangerous cosmetic surgery. I can see that you need a little bit of convincing. You're not really sure what I'm talking about. I mean, what is she talking about? What is she on about? Okay, the death rate from a BBL is one in 3,000. Now that doesn't seem so bad. I mean, 3,000. Let's compare it to the most popular cosmetic procedure, which is the breast augmentation or the boob job. What are the numbers from that? Is it higher or lower? It's lower than that. It's one in 300,000 people die from having a boob job compared to one in 3,000 people from a BBL. That means a BBL is a hundred times more likely to kill you than having a boob job. We're not even talking about infections. We're not talking about misshapen limbs. We're not talking about donkey booties. We're not talking about, you know, lumps and bumps where they shouldn't be. We're not talking about those complications. We're just talking about death, which is obviously the ultimate, ultimate complication. This risk increases when you go out of the UK or somewhere that doesn't have the same safety and health regulation standards. So why is this procedure so dangerous? I mean, why are women knowing all these risks still queuing up to get their bodies fixed? In a BBL, fat has to be placed in specific areas above the muscle. If someone makes a mistake and injects into the wrong place, deep into the muscle, there's a risk that these fat cells can break off into clumps. The fat cells can break off and travel to other areas that they have no right to be and cause deadly consequences. This is what we call a fat embolism. These fat cells can then lodge in the heart vessels and they can cause a heart attack. They can lodge in small vessels in the brain causing a stroke or in the lungs called a pulmonary embolism. These three things are massive serious and deadly consequences that have caused women all around the world to die on the operating table. And it's because of these safety reasons that in 2018, the British Association of Aesthetic and Plastic Surgery recommended that British surgeons stop performing the surgery altogether. However, this is not a mandatory or an enforceable ban and some surgeons are free to carry on, although at their own risk. So we're now onto the opinion part of this video. I said what I said. This is my opinion. You are free to have your own opinion. Let's all talk and chat about it. Drop a comment in the comments below and let's talk. Let's talk. Let's talk. It's a free world. Let's get together and talk about this. The more we're talking about it, the better it will be. It's not a secret. It's not a secret underground thing. We're just talking about cosmetic procedures. It's a free world. So what are my opinions about a BBL? I have several opinions about this. I personally don't agree with a BBL and I don't agree because of many reasons. And some of you might think, well, it's easy for you to say, you're not like me, I'm skinny. You can't say what it feels like. No, I can't say what it feels like because I'm not in your body, but I'm observing the whole trend and how it seems that, you know, we seem to go from one extreme to the other. And I'm just very, very, very nervous to see which direction we're heading into. The first issue that I have about BBL is that it treats the human body as a sum of parts. What do I mean? The human body is so dynamic. It's so, it's the most amazing creation. There's not been AI that's been invented that even matches the human level of complexity. And what we're doing, what are we doing? We've just broken it down into a butt, hips, waist, boobs, hair, nails, lashes, extensions. Is that what we are? Is this what we do? Is this what it means to be a human being? It just makes me puzzled. And we've kind of slowly, 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 slowly crept into this twilight zone. And it's worrying. I feel like over the, over the years, we're now losing less and less of an appreciation for variation. Human beings over millennium and centuries, we've been evolving. It's in our genetic makeup to be varied. That's how we survive. That's how any species survive. No one should have, not one group should have all the attributes. All women should not have, you know, big thighs. All women should not have big waists. 
it should be varied between person to person and I feel that all the generations retain this art much more than us of the millennial, Gen Z, Gen Alpha and beyond. It seems like now our ways of looking at the human body is now through a very, very narrow lens and we don't understand and we don't value diversity. I know diversity lingo is all the rage now in common circles. We talk about inclusivity, but I feel on one hand we're talking about it, but then on the other hand, we're also perpetrating this narrow-minded view of what a woman's body should look like. And that is very harmful, toxic, dangerous. And I think the more we buy into BBL and the more that we validate it as a completely logical thing, the more dangerous and the more we'll spiral down this kind of weird rabbit's hole. I was a teenager and early adult in the whole 2000s and the video vixen era. And on one hand, it's great to see all these women, these attractive women on TV, in the music videos, but it actually perpetrated very harmful stereotypes of what black women we were supposed to be. You were seeing these women with very curvaceous bodies being openly admired by these rappers, these movie stars, these athletes. They were getting positive attention. And for women, getting attention, especially in from the male gaze, is a very empowering thing. But then that left a whole generation of women, young women, teenagers, young children who were watching these women feeling as if they were missing out, as if, oh, I look at my body and I look at her body on the TV and we don't look the same. I've gone, to, I've gone through puberty and I don't have that shape. And that subconsciously makes girls that were a bit more skinny, a bit more lanky, or kind of much more um, svelte, feel like, oh, I'm a black woman and I don't fit into this stereotype. Therefore, I'm feeling less than. And in my work as a cosmetic doctor, I've seen lots of women saying this to me, that I just feel like I'm missing something or I don't feel like I fit in. And that is really sad. And this is showing in the numbers because 50% of women making inquiries about the BBL happen to be black. We don't talk about it, but it's there. It's harmful. It's, it's something that we're not addressing openly about how we're also harming ourselves by perpetrating a lot of these toxic stereotypes. Why is it that women of other races are allowed to be diverse? When we look at the Caucasian population, you have tall women, skin women, Big women, curvy women, petite women, tall women. I said tall twice, but I mean it. But then when it comes to black women, it seems like we are stuck within this very narrow confine. And if you don't fit in with that guidelines, then it seems like you're ostracized or you don't belong. The other thing that bothers me is the fact that we're now looking at body parts and physical attributes as trends. Throughout history, we've had trends. And they've been an indicator of how rich or poor you are, what social class you belong to, what your ethnicity is, all these things. So it's nothing new. But the fact that we're now taking into literal body parts is the concerning bit. As I said before, we've always had trends. You know, we've had trends of the 60s, the 70s, the 80s with the shoulder pads. Trends is part of human cycles and the nature of innovation. However, with physical trends, if today the powers that be said that what's in is purple hair and then polka dot outfits, and you go out and you get your hair dyed purple, and you go to the nearest shop, virtually of course, and you buy a polka dot outfit, you're trendy, you're in, it's great, it's amazing. And then tomorrow, the same powers that be say, oh, actually, it's orange hair that's in, and actually now we're doing leopard print. All you have to do is now just take off your polka dot and exchange it for a leopard print outfit, and you can just go and either get a wig or just get the stylist to dye your hair orange, and you're in. But you can't do that with physical bodies. Can you? No, you can't because these are permanent procedures. These are body modifications that are irreversible, the same way you would look at getting a tattoo. So what do we say then if, let's say in another five, 10, 15 years time, the trend is now towards a lean figure again? I mean, this isn't beyond the realms of possibility. We went through the 90s and the noughties where the trend was to be stick thin 
and have massive boobs. And a whole lot of women were going out and getting augmentation surgeries that were massive, 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 too big for their bodies. Now we're here 15 years later, 20 years later, and we're now talking about massive bums. And again, we have a whole load of women going out to other countries, getting massive, massive, massive amounts of fat injected. Where will they be? And what's the mental harm done to these women? That's what we need to think about. And then we have social media, the root of all evil. No, I kid, I kid, I kid. It's good, it's got its purposes, it's great, it's amazing, it's great, blah, 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 blah. okay. But my point still stands. We wouldn't be in half as much that we're in if it wasn't for social media. Social media has been a tremendous force for the good. It's made a lot of people financially savvy, it's educated people on fitness, it's opened up other worlds that we would have never ever seen. And when it comes to body image and body modification and plastic surgery, it's really made things worse. Social media, Instagram, Facebook, and celebrity culture are glamorizing BBLs and plastic surgery, making it look like it's just a straight walk in the park. I go in, poof, I come out, I'm snatched. Because social media is so accessible, it's also trivializing the whole process. I mean, have a lot of people stopped to think that this is major surgery? Why would you when you see all these Instagram accounts promoting all this stuff left, right and center? You know, you see it's just as simple as a like this, follow that, like this, follow that, share that. And you start to lose a sense of significance about the images that you've seen and sharing. And then when you add in the influencer promotion, which is a huge vehicle that a lot of cosmetic clinics use because it makes them money and it works. You just get this slippery slope to who knows where. You see your favorite influencer popping in to get Botox. Next minute you see them, they've had a BBL. Next minute they've had a boob job. Next minute they've had a second round of BBL. And it all looks so glamorous, it looks so slick. And you know how social media and Instagram puts a filter on everything? That nice rosy glow that you don't see the seedy back parts. You don't see the discomfort. You don't see the complications. You just put a, you know, you just put a filter, you make it nice and easy, you put a nice neat bow and everything looks good and you sell that to the masses. So when you see out there and you see all these nice neat accounts, everything looks so spick and span, you need to think, who is the product? You are the product and you need to be careful. The other little thing I'm just going to nitpick on is about this concept of cosmetic tourism or medical tourism. It's a multi-million dollar industry. And when you look at it from the point of the consumer, which is you or me, it's a no-brainer. I can get more fat taken away, more fat injected, and I can do it for 60% off the price. In Europe, Turkey is the most popular destination, the third most popular in the world after Thailand and Mexico. Other notable entries on the list include the DR, Colombia, Brazil, and Florida in the United States. These places aggressively market themselves towards people that are looking to get more for their money. In Turkey, you can get a BBL for 3,000 pounds, which is less than half of what you would pay here in the UK. And whilst here in the UK, the most amount of fat you can get implanted in each side is 300 cc. You've got some Turkish clinics advertising they can inject up to 1,200 four times the amount of fat in each side. In each side, guys. I'm not kidding. And they do this very openly. Some clinics have a very slick operations and can do up to 200 BBLs per month with up to 40 people at any one time in their recovery houses. So from a customer perspective, it's a no brainer. I mean, why would I pay eight grand to have less? when I can pay less than half of that and have more, I'm going to go to Turkey. They're doing jobs that, I mean, they're doing, they're doing, they're doing real stuff there. They're doing what I want. I want to have a snatched figure eight outline and I've got this person saying it's not realistic. It's not realistic. It's not possible. I'm going to take my ass on a plane and fly to Turkey and get it done and maybe have a holiday whilst I'm there too. Hold your horses. 
before you start booking your next flights to Turkey and contacting the nearest clinic, we are now seeing more and more people coming back from having surgery in countries like Turkey who are increasingly unhappy with their results. But this doesn't get publicized on social media. It's kept quiet and hush hush. This is because the clinics end up over promising and being too aggressive with taking too much fat. All this fat doesn't get enough chance to survive and a significant quantity dies off. You then left looking lopsided or misshapen. There are other telltale signs of bad work. The belly button is a key giveaway. When so much fat is taken away from the waist, the belly button can end up looking distorted. The hip outlines and the profiles just look so unrealistic and cartoonish because it's just so smooth all the way from the waist, like a semicircle, down to the hip. Real women don't look like that. Real bodies don't. They're added dips and kind of kinks here and there. But your brain might not compute it until you've seen this video and then you'll say, ah, so that's what it is. But what you find if you go to a surgeon that's not got a very good aesthetic eye and is not good at trying to recreate what happens in nature is that they just give everybody the same one size fits all shape. Everybody gets this outline, outline, outline and it doesn't necessarily suit you. It might suit her, but you might not get away with it. What happens if you get a BBL and you're not happy with the results? Who do you turn to? I'm sorry to tell you ladies, it's not the NHS. The NHS is not bound to fix your botched BBL. In the UK, the guidelines state that it's the responsibility of the surgeon who did your BBL that has a duty to repair any mistakes. So if the surgeon is still in Turkey, do you have more money saved up to travel back to Turkey, back to the DR, back to Florida to get this stuff fixed? Do you? Do you have more money saved up for more surgeries to correct the work of the first surgeon? Do you have more money saved up for the long-term effects? These are practical things to think about. And unfortunately, these things are not what they will tell you where you go to their shiny cosmetic clinic or where you see their Instagram or social media account. But you need to be thinking about it. And as much as you're saving up for the first surgery, you should also have money in the kitty for any emergencies. My advice is still that if you notice any problems during your recovery, such as signs of infection or lumpiness, or you're just not happy, that you need to go back to the surgeon who treated you. So those are the facts and the opinions according to Dr. K. So if having heard all I've got to say, all my warnings and cautions and everything, you still wanna go ahead, that's fine. I'm not gonna be offended. It's fine, it's fine, I'm good. What are my top tips though? Number one is to do your research. Very simple, but in practice, a lot of people fail because they miss or skip this step. Don't be fooled by the commercial and the slick marketing on their Instagram page or the fact that a particular influencer went to that clinic. You need to do your own due diligence and there are lots more resources out there. There are Facebook groups now that are kind of set up to discuss different surgeons and clinics and you can look at examples of their work. There's realself.com and that's another good helpful website that talks about all sorts of plastic surgery, not just BBL. So I'd recommend that you check those out. Take your time. Don't let anyone sway you into a decision and don't make a decision on the basis of a discount or some kind of a promotion. You're just playing Russian roulette with your life and your body. Number two, don't go cheap. I know we're all savvy consumers and we're doing price comparisons from everything from the price of a loaf of bread all the way to your next big purchase. And whilst you can use price as a helpful guide, it shouldn't be the be all and end all of your decision making. Look at the experience and the skill of the surgeon. Try and get examples of their work. If you can, and it's possible to, try and contact the people that have had surgery by that surgeon. And if you're going for surgery, that's around the 3000 mark. I really wouldn't. I really, really wouldn't. I fail to see how you can get a decent quality surgeon for three grand that's gonna do really, really good work. You might be watching this and you might have gone through and had a decent BBL for 3,000 pounds. And to that, I would say you're one of the lucky ones. You survived. You played Russian roulette and you won. 
Now don't do it again. My last tip is to follow the aftercare. Don't cut corners. Don't think you know better than the surgeon or the clinic. They've been doing this for years. So if they tell you you need to do this, then that's what you do. Even if it doesn't make sense to you or you think, why am I having to, you know, stand upside down on a Friday and sing do la la, you need to do it. Obviously, they won't ask you to do that, but that was just a very cheeky example. But whatever they ask you to do as part of the aftercare, do it. That way you can ensure that you've done the best that you can to get the best results. So that's it. Those are my three top tips for getting a BBL. And remember, a BBL is not just for Christmas or for Valentine's Day, it's for life. You need to have a mindset shift and realize that the people that get the best results from a BBL maintain their results. They work out, they eat healthy, they keep as much as possible to a healthy weight. And that's how you'll be happier with your results. So that's all I got for today. I hope you liked it. And if you did, then give me a thumbs up and drop me a comment below with a peach emoji. That way I can know that you made it to the very end. If you have controversial opinions of your own or you disagree with any of the points that I made, then let me know. Tell me, I wanna hear from you. I wanna hear what you've got to say. It's fine, it's a free country, let's debate, let's have a conversation. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really appreciate it. And if you like my content, why not subscribe? Click on that subscribe button and click the bell button to be notified whenever I publish new videos which is on Sundays, by the way. Until then, take care, guys. Bye.